I was nobbed by two secret policemen and uh, interrogated for 12 hours. Welcome to Cold War Conversations. This is the British Broadcasting Corporation. Well, who's our first letter from today, Edward? Uh, an old friend of yours, Doris Bryan Hartley of Thornton Le Field, asking what's being done to build up Anglo Soviet relations. And I'm here to host this final program from the German Democratic Republic for you. Welcome to episode 17 of Cold War Conversations. In 1968, today's guest was a 15-year-old at the same school in Prague as Czech communist leader Alexander Dubček's son. Jan Kulic provides a valuable eyewitness account of the heady days of the Prague Spring and the subsequent Warsaw Pact invasion. He provides some insightful views that I found challenged my understanding of the Prague Spring. He details the situation in Czechoslovakia in the late 1960s, the Prague Spring, his experiences as the reformers were suppressed in the late 1970s, and his arrest by the STB, the Czech Secret Police. The interview starts as we talk about the levels of censorship in Czechoslovakia before the Prague Spring. I think Antonin Masha, the film director, is saying that it, by about 64, 65, the censorship office no longer pursued ideology. It was only if you said F the Soviet Union, they would actually yeah. remove that, right? Yeah. But it, it was they only looked for really vulgar in, insults against the Communist Party, but they actually yeah. didn't dispute the overall ideological subversive message of the film, which is very interesting. Yeah, no, that is interesting because the impression you get sort of from, from outside reading about things is that the, the Novotny regime was quite hard, quite hardcore. But obviously what, what, what you're saying is if you stepped over a certain line, they would hit you hard, but they did give you quite a bit of latitude before you hit that line. It's very interesting. Uh, if you look at Václav Havel in the 68, Toronto 68 Publishers edition of his plays called Hry, right, has a kind of uh, introduction there. And he basically says that in the 60s, with his absurd plays uh, premiered at the theater on the balustrade here on the corner as well, he says that it was fun because actually you, knew, you pushed and the doors opened. Yeah. And he said, after the Soviet invasion from 1970, suddenly it was a totally different atmosphere. He says, a harsh Asiatic kind of shrill wind, which mm. nobody was used to. Now it was serious. Yeah. But apparently in the 60s, it wasn't. Even he says that in that, yeah. in the, in the preface, right? Yeah. Even, even before the Prague Spring, it was you know, lenient. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. I've, yes, I've yes. read about the, the 1967 Writers' Congress, and from what you're saying, yes. a lot of those yes. people who'd moved up into higher positions yes. were obviously at that Congress and trying to push even further for reform. Well, Watsulik, Watsulik was saying there, look, this is amazing. We are supposed to have socialism here, and it's been 20 years, and somebody is still kicking us up our backside. <laughs> <laughs> and... and uh, Kundera had an absolutely brilliant speech there, which is actually, I would say, relevant to this very day, even though he kind of, it's a kind of period thing that they emphasize so much, this culture thing, which nobody really gives a damn about these days. But he basically was arguing there that, look, we, the Czechs, as a result of us being in what he saw as the heart of Europe, have had this unique experience. We've experienced democracy in the interwar period, Nazism, then Stalinism, now reforming communism. This mm -hmm. is maybe more than uh, most people, he self-centeredly said, um, have experienced anywhere in the world. And yeah. we are uniquely positioned to bear witness to this in the arts. 
that thereby enriching the world. In order to be able to do this, we have to have freedom of creativity and uh, of, of artistic freedom. And this was the, because he said, if we do not have this, what's the point of the Czech language? Yeah. If we only export Pilsner beer, <laughs> that's not, uh, that we don't need the language for that. We can basically give it all up. Yeah. And this is, I will add slightly sadly, has happened because Czech Republic now exports Pilsner beer. Yeah. But not literature. Okay, yeah. anyway. Yeah. So what, what did your parents and friends think of Dubček and the, the Prague Spring? Did they really think that was permanent change that was coming? Um, well, it was, it was a very teenage orgy. I, I remember it as, as, uh, to this very day that it, it all started uh, on the 20th of March, 1968, when there was a program there were, there were regular programs of questions and answers after the main news, which was then broadcast on Radio Prague at 7 o'clock. And uh, this, 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 this question and answer program started at 7.30. And this was uh, a program which was broadcast from uh, what is now called the exhibition area, Vistaviště. It was then called the Julius Fucic uh, sort of recreation area, whatever. It's a large hall panel discussion um, uh, actually, it wasn't broadcast from the very beginning because they said it had started an hour earlier so that they recorded it and broadcast it with a one-hour delay. But nevertheless, it started being broadcast from that tape with a one-hour delay. And uh, I was sitting here with my parents in the kitchen and it started being incredibly open. It started talking about Stalin's crimes, about the crimes of the Communist Party. And uh, we just listened to it with our mouths open. And normally these programs were about an hour. Mm. This went on until about two o'clock in the morning. The schedules were dropped. I remember at about midday, uh, the, the, it was uh, sort of uh, um, the, the uh, uh, continuity announcer came on and said, uh, dear listeners, we just, I mean, we are still broadcasting it from those tapes. We are one hour behind, but I think we should probably just cut that hour and go live now, right? Mm. So, so they did that. And uh, then at about 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning, they said, I'm sorry, we have to stop this now because we have to prepare for the morning broadcast. <laughs> and that was for us the beginning of the Prague Spring. Right. And I, I actually, actually was, uh, last autumn, I was con co uh, contacted by BBC Radio 4 program History Today who uh, wanted to do something about the Prague Spring. And I told them about this. And they said, this is very interesting. Do you think we could, uh, it, it, does the recording exist? So I talked to Rako Kubitschkov, uh, um, the chair of PLUS, and he got me in touch with the head of the archives at Prague Radio. Yeah. I got an email from this head of the archives, which says, Mr. Chulik, you've got a good memory. It was indeed broadcast on the 20th of March, 1968. And, uh, We've got seven hours of tapes here, which covers it. So they, it does exist. And I understand that actually Prague Radio have put excerpts from this on, on, on the web now. Wow. So there you are. Wow. Okay. That's amazing. That's so that, was the, that, yeah, that was the beginning. And it started for us with a bang with this. And then it went on like that because basically the Prague Spring, nothing was done. There are various films which were made by people who were born in the 70s or 80s about the Prague Spring feature films. And they absolutely don't understand it. They have, they, they have people starting sort of uh, private pubs, uh, you know, glitzy pubs, like, I mean, somebody sort of opened a pub in the 1990s, but it wasn't like that at all. Nothing was really done, but people constantly discussed politics, right? Yeah. Because at the beginning, they had to exercise the horrors of, of Stalinism, and they were absolutely fantastic, uh, uh, television programs, you know, the, the debates, yeah. uh, com confronting a uh, secret police interrogator with his victim. Yeah. Why did you drown me in that bath? You know, try to, yeah. try to kill me or whatever. Absolutely amazing television. Uh, radio as well. Yeah. Radio and television broadcasts became real celebrities. So first there was this uh, exercising of the past. And then, of course, from about mid-May, uh, you started having this pressure from the uh, five allies. 
especially the East Germans didn't like it, right? Yeah. Uh, and yeah. the East Germans felt that Ulbricht, the head of the Communist Party, really pressurized the Russians. Mm. Uh, it's quite interesting. The argument was that the Czechoslovaks, with their irresponsibility, will start a nuclear war. <laughs> and uh, I was really quite stunned in 2005. I was, I was at a conference uh, in Siena in Italy, Mm. And there were some German scholars there from uh, what used to be East Germany, and they still said this. So wow. <laughs> it, was, it was interesting that this was obviously uh, the East German's official, yeah. official propaganda. But it, it, the whole thing appealed to a, to a 15-year-old yeah. because yeah. it was incredibly teenage. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, you can read the stuff, um, uh, Antonin Lim who was a sort of major figure in the literary uh, novine, then Liste, um, sort of uh, set up, mm-hmm. and a major film critic, later emigrated, uh, worked in America at university, p- published Letter Internationale or whatever, mm-hmm. in, uh, to mark the 20th anniversary of the Prague Spring in 1988, he published a kind of Czech language reader in, in, in the West, about, about 300 pages of that sort of tightly packed articles which were published in, in 68. And there, there's one, one uh, piece by Pavel Kohout in it from maybe late July 68 when the pressure from the, from the Warsaw Pact allies was really very strong. And there were these constant debates in the streets on Mustek in Wenceslas Square, people. And uh, uh, Kohout talks about this in this piece and says, that uh, uh, a citizen accosted him asking him, what, what will you do, you irresponsible bastard, if the Russians invade? Mm. And Kohout quite cheekily said, maybe we shouldn't uh, take notice of it then. <laughs> and I don't know. This is, this is what, in a sense, when the invasion took place, um, uh, the, the Czechs, Czechoslovaks did. Yeah. They just continued as it was. Yeah, they just they, carried they, on they, and ignored, yeah, they, they, ignore the it. Whole, the whole kind of um, Prague Spring was this orgy of debate and trying to persuade people and how well everybody meant mm. everything. And uh, I, in, in sort of late May, I think, Dubček tried to slightly clamp, clamp down on it, right? And there were, of course, howls of protests. And he actually, there are, there's a front page of Dikobras, which was the official Communist Party Certificate Weekly, where actually Dubček is, Dubček is really uh, criticized for trying to clamp down on freedom of the press. Mm. You know, there is, uh, there is this fairy tale about uh, the porridge and uh, be, being, uh, you know, and this magic word, uh, pot boil porridge and pot stop and uh, how the, this, this, uh, sort of person doesn't know how to stop it and the whole village is covered with porridge, right? Um, um, the Czech folk tale. Yeah. And Dubček is depicted on the front page of this Dikobras thing as saying, pot boil now, freedom of speech, now stop it. You know, so, so actually <laughs> yeah. it's, it's quite interesting that there was actually criticism, public criticism, media criticism yeah. of Dubček towards the end of, yeah. of uh, May. Well, from what uh, I and, and, yeah, yeah from what I understand about Dubček is that he still wanted the, um, you know, the Czechoslovakia to be a single party state and still have the leading role of the Communist Party. Well, this is this is not Dubček. There's one one interesting thing, which is basically, in spite of men, many of these reformist communists being being uh, reformists and wanting to do this socialism with human face and, and yeah. this third way, which then I suppose the Labour Party under Blair flirted uh, uh, with in Britain in the 1990s. Um, they actually did believe in Marxist theory, right? Yeah. And Marxist theory tells you that uh, human development is based on technological progress uh, society is patterned on the basis of uh, the given state of technological progress. So, for instance, if you only have hoes, you have feudalism. If you start having kind of uh, primitive machinery, you start having manufacturers and you start having capitalism. Now we have computers or whatever, right? And, yeah. and this, this, this inexorable progress, which is basically they believed not... 
associated with humans' will, because it happens no matter what you do, will lead to communism. Yeah. And they believed in this. So because it was once given, I just don't understand how anybody could believe that this religion, but they did. Because it's given, they believe that sort of history will decree that the, um, uh, that the um, population will always vote communist. Yeah. So there was a lot of discussion about it. Of course, the Communist Party has to deserve the trust of the people and all that. But of course, it's up out of the question. It will always win the elections. And of course, in 68, it was very easy to believe this because people did actually support it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because they were, yeah. But, and you could actually ask me, right, didn't they see that people in the West, in so-called capitalism, actually that the communists didn't win the elections? Mm. And of course, the answer to this would be, ah, but we are on a much more advanced level of economic and social development. They are just backward society. Yeah. Yeah. And didn't Czechoslovakia have one of the highest votes for the Communist Party? Well, in forty in forty six, but yeah. uh, but uh, uh, it was the Czech Western part. Czechoslovakia historically was quite left wing, but it was mostly social democratic. Yeah. Also, the social welfare in the interwar period was uh, fairly advanced compared, for instance, to Britain. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but who knows how how people would have voted uh, uh, voted because obviously during the the communist era you didn't have free elections. You didn't have so, a free vote. No, absolutely. No, 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 no absolutely. No, no. And there's a strong so, history of social democracy and you know from Benesh and you know from yes. The, but of course, the then of course in in the nineties you had a kind of. Uh, uh, counter-reaction against the 40 years of communism quite understandably so anything yeah. that was associated with left-wing ideas was actually uh, was actually really uh, criticized or mocked by the mainstream yeah when when did you hear that Czechoslovakia had been invaded how did you discover that the Russians had come in Telef- telephone calls four o'clock in the morning um I remember on the night of the 20th of August, it was very hot like today, I suppose. The, the windows here were open. The family was watching a flat, uh, were watching a film on Czech television, which seemed to be uh, unending. It's called uh, Reka Charuje, The Magic of the River. It's, it's some kind right. of, it was a classic sort of film from the 30s, I think, uh, which is about a man who is kind of rejuvenated in all his troubles by by sort of living near a river or something, whatever. Yeah. And this is very lyrical, and uh, it was interminable. Then we went to bed, and there was, there was a weird noise because the windows were open. Mm-hmm. And this was these uh, uh, sort of uh, carrier planes uh, bringing those tanks. And then right. at 4 o'clock in the morning, somebody uh, sort of phoned up saying, we, you, you've been, we've been occupied. And uh, actually, I understand that quite a lot of people learned about it from these phone calls. Right. You know that... Uh, uh, Radio Prague tried to broadcast the, the, the Communist Party learned about it at about 11 o'clock. They wrote a protest a note, which uh, Prague Radio tried to broadcast just before closing down at yeah. 1 o'clock I think in the morning and only one sentence was was broadcast because Mr. Karel Hoffman switched off the transmitters and he was later on I think in 2004 or something actually sentenced for sabotage for this. It is quite interesting wow. there. And um, but however, it was re- the, the, these uh, these um, uh, transmitters were reinstated, and uh, I have to say that on the morning of the twenty first of August, I immediately tried to because I was an avid listener to the radio. Obviously, uh, to try to actually sort of pick up the radio stations. They wouldn't be brought. They weren't broadcasting on their normal frequencies. So I, I would have thought that by five o'clock they should have already been on air, nothing. Yeah. But then they, they we found it on, on other frequencies. And then, of course, there is this very famous broadcast. I, I of course, switched on, on the tape recorder. We still have the recording. I've got it in Glasgow, not here now, but no, nevertheless, no. everybody has it. So um, the when the uh, building in uh, Vinohradská street was actually by about nine o'clock in the morning occupied by uh, the Russian troops. First, you heard actually shooting, uh, the playing of the Czech national anthem. Then actually they didn't need to still leave, so they went on for a bit longer and then they signed off. But uh, they very quickly, apparently there was some kind of network of underground broadcasting studios for the post, for the eventuality of 
a NATO invasion, and they actually activated this. Right. And uh, so, and and what what uh, this is, this was absolutely television also came on air, but it was more difficult for them technically. Yeah. But radio actually never ceased broadcasting, and they are the absolute heroes. They actually um, prevented bloodshed. They provided information. They told the, the population to talk to the soldiers to say that there was no counter-revolution. Of course, the population did do this. Yeah. They, 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 were, they absolutely immediately engaged with the Russian soldiers sitting uh, embarrassed on those tanks mm -hmm. in these kind of strike spring discussions. And the other thing is that, of course, the streets were immediately uh, plastered with posters and jokes. And basically, uh, it is very really strange, but the whole nation kind of ended up in a kind of weird euphoria because it kind of united the nation. You had the radio. The radio uh, started broadcasting this. Uh, they they uh, divided their broadcasting into 15-minute slots and they kind of switched over from, and uh, you, you would hear, this is Radio Česká Budějovice. We are now switching over to Radio Košice. So they, quite paradoxically, amazingly, under the Russian uh, uh, bayonets, under the Russian tanks, they just uh, ran a, an incredibly efficient sort of nationwide broadcasting system for the whole week until the kidnapped leaders of the Communist Party were actually brought back from, from Moscow by, uh, by President Svoboda. Yeah. So it is these heroes who actually, uh, who actually uh, kept, I suppose, the situation without bloodshed. Having yeah. said that, there's a, there's a book, a quite obscure book by a man called Fred Eilin, an American who worked as a researcher in Radio Free Europe in the 70s and actually was also, I think, arrested at a time in Czechoslovakia by the Czech secret police. And it's called The Logic of Normalization. Nobody really knows it very well. It's in English. And he argues there, quite interestingly, that actually the uh, Soviet embassy misled Brezhnev and the uh, leadership of the Soviet Communist Party, basically saying that what was that the Prague Spring was only a conspiracy of a few handful, several tens of thousands of intellectuals who controlled the media, yeah, and that the population was pro-Soviet. And so, and this is quite interesting because he argues that if you compare the Soviet invasion. Uh, to the massacres in Budapest in 1956. Mm -hmm. It is true that uh, probably about 100 people or thereabouts were killed during the invasion, but these were mostly accidents. And it is true that the population were, uh, sorry, the, the, the Russian soldiers were actually given the instruction to regard the civilian population as friendly, mm. right? So that, uh, so that this is quite interesting. There is, there is a lot of rhetoric about the brutal invasion of uh, the Prague Spring of 68. But actually, I think they wanted to, if Fred Light Island is right, I think they wanted to get those counter-revolutionaries and they, they were given this information that they, they were sort of maybe, maybe 50,000 counter-revolutionaries. And in fact, this is what they did during the purges. They just purged everybody from the universities and from the media. And that was that. Because... And I refer again to that absolute frustration of a 17-year-old who couldn't understand how the whole nation, after the head of the nation had been decapitated, how just they could actually go along with, 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 with the communist nonsense again. Yeah. Yeah. So what did you do during that period? I mean, you, you come out of your house on the 21st of August. Well, my, my parents didn't allow me to go to Vinohradska, right? Okay. But uh, I, I was I was actually uh, around here. Uh, I was in Prague. Um, uh, yeah, what, what, what I didn't finish saying that actually you walked the streets and they were actually all the shop windows were totally covered with paper, with these jokes. With uh, I mean, again, media orgy. The newspapers and the weeklies started sort of printing uh, several editions per day, right? And they just, they just, the, the, the printing offices would print them, and you had these vans moving around in Prague who would just toss these uh, packs of freshly printed newsprint into the streets, and people would avidly undo it and read it and uh, yeah. uh, put it up on the walls of, of, of houses. So, so uh, it was a kind of very, very kind of euphoric thing. So, basically, what you did, you, um, you listened to the radio yeah. for, for the whole week. And actually, what uh, happened, I don't know whether you, you've actually heard about this. Uh, later on, these soldiers were uh, given the 
instructions, the Soviet soldiers were given the instructions when they see people, because people were walking about with their small transistor radios around, mm -hmm. and they were supposed to be confiscating these, right? Yeah. So they, they confiscated these radios from some people, and some, because Czechs are uh, sort of ironic, uh, some people could uh, took uh, pieces of coal or coal bricks and mm -hmm. went to the Soviet soldiers putting these coal bricks to their ears, <laughs> and the Russian soldiers would confiscate those as well. Brilliant. <laughs> oh, that's a good. That's a good story. That one. So Shvekian, Shvekian, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. So, so there, there wasn't depression. There was euphoria. Then, when when Dubček came, I mean, there were calls for neutrality. Mm. Uh, there, there, there were. There were uh, Prior to that, actually, uh, people watched it. They didn't want to. Uh, they didn't want to say anything against socialism, and they really wanted, basically, to say yes, we are willing to support uh, the the uh, leading role of the Communist Party or, or all that. I think that, I mean, Dubček was kind of fetid, but I think mo most people and my parents certainly maybe uh, didn't. Re he was very hesitant. I mean, I would say that his most um, a characteristic feature was that he wasn't a criminal. He wasn't sending babies into detention camps. Or yeah. Whatever. But, you know, but uh, he just, he just basically uh, wasn't going to oppress people, right? Yeah. But that was about it. And he was actually very idealistic in a kind of naive way towards Russia. And actually he thought that the Russians would uh, accommodate his reforms and um, uh, later on, he, of course, said that, they, that it was a personal tragedy for him and that they totally betrayed him and disappointed him. Uh, Dubček studied in uh, or lived in Russia and actually was an uh, almost native, only a native Russian speaker. So yeah. he actually loved Russia with all uh, So, So this is, in, in itself, that's ridiculous, frankly, yeah. uh, loving and, the communist regime. Yeah, and so, Brezhnev really so, trusted him as well at the start. I mean, he yes, was a yes, yes, man. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So anyway, so there, there were before they came, came, when they came back uh, and presented this kind of thing that uh, you have to uh, obey our Soviet comrades, for a few hours on the radio, you had really strong calls for neutrality, and this is ridiculous, and these people who have been in Mo Moscow have kind of betrayed us, and they and uh, for, for what the mood of the nation is, it's quite understandable because they were out of out of touch with the nation for the whole week. Yeah. And then, of course, Dubček came on the radio with his sobbing speech. And he managed, I don't know, I don't know whether the intention was this because, because um, mm, I don't know, he wasn't really a strategist. But nevertheless, the, when he sobbed, everybody kind of took it back and said, yes, Comrade Dubček, and we know what, we will support you and we promise you and all of that. And, and so, so uh, the, all the talk about neutrality, which would have, I mean, no, nothing could have been done about it. the country no. was occupied, was yeah. stopped. So, yeah. Yeah. And so what, you know, what uh, things gradually changed then? Um, well, the, 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 autumn, the, the autumn was still um, incredibly... Uh, now, certain things were banned in the media. You were not allowed to criticize the Soviet Union. You were not supposed, allowed to say occupation. But actually, um, you could still listen to Radio Free Europe absolutely normally, and there, there still wasn't really a uh, um, difference between what Radio Prague broadcasts or, say, Radio Free Europe. Um, some of these celebrities, like Slava Volny, who was now, now forgotten long dead uh, from the Prague Spring, ended up there, I remember, on Mondays at uh, 2110, uh, 10 o'clock after. Was it 2110? I may be wrong. Uh, no, a quarter to nine it was, because at nine o'clock uh, after the news, you had the main uh, current affairs program. Um, he had this program called Listy Psaterum Letters to Friends. It was incredibly, from about, he, he defected fairly early on Radio Free Europe. It was incredibly emotional. Everybody listened to it from, from, from I don't know, of, I don't know when this was, November maybe, for another mm -hmm. roughly year, when you could ro ro listen to it without, without uh, it being uh, jammed. And uh, in November uh, 68, there was a uh, university and secondary school student strike against the clamp, slow, slow clampdown of the reforms, which we took part in at the secondary school as students of the first year. 
And then, of course, uh, after uh, now Christmas, television programs, quite nationalistic, kind of, we are all united, we all know against whom, you know, and, and sort of uh, toasts on New Year's Eve at mi midnight letters the best and this nation mustn't be on its knees and all that kind of stuff yeah. so so it was still nudge nudge wink wink constantly right yeah uh, still so i would say that certainly the media were not normalized i mean uh, literary noviny uh, which were actually closed down or, or given over to uh, uh, jan zelenka who was the pro pro stalinist collaborator in the summer of uh, 67 uh, stopped publishing, then started publishing as literary liste in the spring of 68. They mm. restarted after the invasion as liste and continued uh, publication until about March 69, when they were eventually uh, basically uh, closed down. Yeah. But um, uh, this liste uh, weekly uh, but still managed to publish a very... Um, sort of seminal basically debate between Havel and Kundera about the Czech lot and whether, whether the Prague Spring was a wonderful uh, sort of new opportunity for mankind or whether it was just a normal return to democratic practice and we shouldn't be crowing about it, crowing about it which is what Havel said. So, so these, uh, the, these debates, he actually, uh, his reply was published in another subversive uh, uh, monthly this time called Tvaš. So actually, uh, freedom of publication continued until about sort of late '69, um, the spring, spring, uh, late spring '69, and of course, in on the 16th of January 1969, you had the uh, you uh, you had the immolation of Jan Palach, yeah, and uh, I mean about a million people took part in his funeral. Again, this was absolutely non-ideological and, and, uh, and uh, anti-communist. And you had Jaroslav Seifert, the poet, later Nobel Prize winner, going on television saying, young people, don't do this. We are, 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 we are in a terrible plight as a nation. This is true, but actually, do not kill yourself. It breaks our hearts. So, so you had things like that on television in January 69. So uh, it was still very, very open, right? And then you had these uh, famous uh, uh, ice hockey championships in March um, uh, 69, when twice the Czech team won over the Russians. And this pro provoked jubilation, but apparently the secret police, Czech secret police now, used this as a provocation. Um, and they burnt down the Aeroflot offices at Wenceslas Square. Mm. Uh, and they used it as a pretext for a clampdown. Um, it's quite interesting. I was watching the first part of Agnieszka Holland's film about Palach. Uh, I think it was an HBO production, The Burning Bush. The, the script was written by a 30-year-old. I couldn't watch it any, any, any further. It is absolute stereotypical rubbish. Because I am, I am really surprised maybe Agnieszka Holland uh, was, is younger than me. But basically, he creates this later on, possibly, I'm told, it, it may be all right when it deals with the oppression of the Palach family in the town of Shetati, where he was from, or whatever. But the, the, the weeks around Palach's um, uh, funeral in that mm -hmm. film are presented as a kind of black and white vision, this, the communist Stalinist secret police clamping down on us and uh, oppressed nation. It wasn't like that. It was, the situation was still incredibly in a state of flux. Yeah. There were people in the government who were, uh, I mean, this was the time when Jan Kavan, who then got into real trouble, actually emigrated into, into Britain, and he was in touch with the Czech embassy, and actually he was the head of the, the Czechoslovak uh, Association of Czechoslovak uh, Students in the United Kingdom. And he actually got about 30 pounds from this, uh, from uh, some kind of official at the embassy in London uh, to hire a hall for a meeting of this uh, association. Mm. And he was uh, later on often foul mouthed for this being said, said, being told that this was a kind of sort of payment from the secret police because it transpired that that uh, official was a secret police agent there. But Kavan uh, uh, rightly said that that man was actually absolutely pro Dubček. This was kind of February, yeah. March 69, and the embassy was pro Dubček. And the, yeah. the, the kind of uh, sort of uh, 
accusations that you were working with Stalinist normalization, Hussak police is nonsense. And this is what it was. I can testify that the situation wasn't... I'll, I'll tell you a little... Uh, the, the same thing, secondary school. I know that they really worked us with the rule of iron because we had to learn these uh, sort of texts, uh, totally what they dictated to us, like in the Middle Ages, uh, in a, some kind of monastery when they, you know, made books by dictating them to monks. In, in, eventually we rebelled and told them, uh, go go to hell with all this. This is not teaching. But that was the, in the fourth year. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, uh, our... Uh, secondary school teachers. I mean, this is when it's when it all started. You started having these conspiracies with your teachers. Okay, so we had a Russian uh, teacher who taught us Russian at secondary school and uh, uh, Russian literature, li Russian language, and uh, she started translating Solzhenitsyn, uh, the first circle, mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, she hand, uh, wrote it out in longhand, and we offered students in her class that we would type it out. So we did, did this sum is that with her. Um, the, in the same uh, cabinet, there was our class uh, form teacher uh, who taught us Czech literature, and she was also the uh, keeper of the school library, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the list of the books in the school library was displayed type type list. This was pre-computerized age, obviously, on kind of uh, um, A2-sized uh, glazed panels in the school corridor. There were maybe about 30 of them. Mm -hmm. uh, so that actually you could go and see it's an alphabetical list. You could see which books were in the library. Now, in about 1970, um, the... Uh, uh, regulations came saying that there were a lot of authors which were banned, right? Mm -hmm. So these had to be removed from the library. And the head of the library uh, was forced to remove, but there, was no, there were no computers, the names and titles of these books from that uh, publicly displayed list. And she grumbled and said, I am not going to be retyping these 100 pages. So what she did, she took black ink and actually blackened out all the banned authors, right? right. And li it looked horrendous. Yeah. It looked like under the Nazi occupation because you kind of, this was about 70. You basically went to the, uh, uh, went along the corridor and you saw that maybe 20, 30% of the, of the books had been kind of blackened out like that. Yeah. And she was forced to retype it. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yes. So, so she was saying, I am not retyping this. Yes, she did. <laughs> Gosh. Um, yes. And so you, you, you were at Charles University. Is that where you... Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I had... Um, the, the reason why... The reason why I got there... Again, I, 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 I was admitted there to, to study Czech and English in 72, right? Which was really already a very, very uh, harsh time. Um, I mean, a normalization, of course. I mean, Husak at the beginnings, because he was in prison in uh, the 50s. Yeah. And of course, in the, during the Prague Spring, he played uh, a, a liberal. He was a supporter of the Prague Spring, don't forget, right? Yeah. So it was a great surprise that he turned really a neo stylist but he said, he nevertheless did say that he will make sure that nobody is going to be uh, really seriously prosecuted. And I mean, he didn't, he broke his word because there were people like Euros who spent, I think, about seven years in prison. Better all poor men who also spent about six years. But they didn't kill anyone, right? Mm -hmm. But they did. Uh, the police in Hrvatskaro, that was the end of the 80s, did kill Pavel Bonka. This is true. But that was just the uh, local sadism rather than, I suppose, the decision of the, of the central authorities. So, so it was really quite interesting because with normalization, when it came, it was obvious that no matter what you did in 68, if you were willing to denigrate yourself and to basically bespatter yourself and say, I'm going to uh, collaborate with you, they would reward you. I mean, if you look uh, at, at films like The Ear by Kachinya, where the actors, uh, Lukavsky, uh, no, 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 Brzo Bohaty and uh, uh, Bohdalova played an absolute, uh, it's just an anti-communist tour de force, Break up. It's, it's like uh, who's afraid of Virginia Woolf, but it's it, 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 within the communist context. Mm. And so this, they, they couldn't be a more anti-communist film. These people, obviously, I don't know what they did, but they were never banned. 
they continued uh, sort of acting in, in the sort of uh, top films throughout the 70s and 80s. And, uh, you know, so when you actually were willing to uh, say, I'm going to collaborate with you, the, the, you were accepted. And yeah. there were, of course, many people who, uh, who refused to do this. But also, also there was this mild consumerism, which I, will, I have to say that in the 60s, the, the country was still quite poor. I mean, uh, the fact that um, my parents didn't have a television until 68, they had an incredibly old car mm. from the 30s where uh, it used to be a taxi, uh, wow. which was uh, started with a manual handle and my father had to go down the street when he wanted to go anywhere and sort of turn the handle for about half an hour, having first put hot water into the radiator. So, so the, yeah. <laughs> this was kind of the... the, the uh, yeah, my parents didn't have much money, even though my mother was a... Was a, was a uh, was a medical doctor. I remember yeah. how she had tatankas for lunch so that she would have money for the food. So that was the 60s. Mm. But in the 70s, everybody had their second home suddenly, their, their color TV sets, their fridges, you know. Uh, so that they went to, the, the, to Bulgaria to, for their holidays. I mean, it's in that uh, play by Havel, uh, Private View, you may know it, about basically uh, intellectual friends where one becomes a dissident and the, the other couple become indulged that they start indulging as a kind of escapism in this consumerist life. So this is yeah. what it was. That I remember, I mean, they started selling Coke at the Yalta Hotel in the Winchester Square, you know, and it yeah. would cost what then was about 25 crowns, which would be about 250 now, uh, yeah. I suppose, or more. And the, 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 the weight would bring it in a crystal glass on a, on a silver tray with the, its shaking hand. You know, they, the, yeah. the, 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 the Western consumerism was kind of fetishized. It, would, it yeah. had become a fetish here. And, and basically the regime said, if you repeat the rubbish, which no, no longer anybody believed in, you can actually have bits of the Western consumerism. Yeah. So yeah. basically, there was no ideology in the 70s anymore. Yeah. But how I got to the university, uh, I, was I was avidly listening to Radio Free Europe uh, as a teenager, mm. and then it was becoming ever more difficult. But actually, this is another, I mean, this is, uh, this is very, very, very long, but uh, a little technical detour, right? They broadcast on, uh, on shortwave. Do you know anything about this? Why it wasn't possible to totally jam it? No, I don't. Right. This, this is another kind of, uh, nothing could be done about it. Now, uh, if you broadcast on shortwave, especially on uh, incredibly short waves, like the, the shortest ones, 13, 16, 19, 19 meters, um, uh, these, on these very short waves, the signal from the transmitter is disseminated within about 10 miles of the vicinity of the transmitter, but then it bounces off the uh, ionosphere and uh, bounces down at the distance of about 2,000 miles, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the problem is that it only does this if the ionosphere is sunlit, okay? Mm. So, um, what they did, Radio Free Europe had, broadcast, uh, had transmitters in Portugal, okay? Mm. So that actually the signal would bounce off the ionosphere and get into the Czech Republic. <laughs> but of course, the Czech communist authorities didn't want this uh, people to listen to this, right? Yeah. So they had jammers. But since it was broadcast on these incredibly short, short waves, they couldn't do it from the territory of Czechoslovakia, which is too small, right? right. Yeah. So they uh, got Russian help, and the jamming transmitters were beyond the Euros, right? Oh. So you had this kind of pan-European struggle whereby the Americans were broadcasting radio for Europe from Portugal to Czechoslovakia, and the Russians were jamming it from beyond the Euros, right? <laughs> now, however, and, and this all depended on the bouncing back of the signal of both these sets of transmitters of the ionosphere. Mm -hmm. But the condition, it only works if the ionosphere is sunlit. Yeah. Time difference. The problem was that in Russia it gets dark about three hours before it gets dark in Portugal. <laughs> right? Yeah. So what happened, especially in winter months, from about three o'clock in the afternoon, the Russian transmitters were absolutely dysfunctional. Uh, the jammers were trans uh, dysfunctional. Yeah. So there was a slot of three hours of that time difference where you could actually listen to the broadcast of Radio Free Europe 
between about four o'clock in the afternoon and about seven o'clock in the in the evening because yeah. of this thing that nobody could do anything about, right? Yeah. Why did I start talking about uh, radio free? Oh, that I was avidly listening to this. Yeah. I thought sorry for this detail, but I thought this is interesting. No, no, that nobody is. remembers these things these days, right? No, okay. it's good. I like. Uh, they, yeah, they of course I have to add. Um, they, of course, had these local jammers, right? So you could not listen to the Czech broadcasts of the Radio Free Europe in Prague because at the Petsin Hill, you had incredibly ferocious jammers and you just, and, and, and the, your radio would almost break with the noise, right? Mm. But you went to Motol and there you could hear it already because the local transmit, because the direct wave only works within about 10 miles. So, so actually, they were really interested, the communist regime, of actually blocking these broadcasts uh, for the big cities mm -hmm. because this is where the intellectuals live, right? Yeah. But Radio Free Europe actually knew this and knew that people had these second homes and th that people had this kind of sort of habit of going uh, on Friday night to mm -hmm. their country cottages to listen to Radio Free Europe where they would do the kind of rerun repeats of the most important programs of the past week for the intellectuals who couldn't listen to it in, 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 in the cities. Now, I was, uh, so I was quite an avid shortwave uh, follower, mm -hmm. and there was a lot of Morse code uh, on, on the shortwaves. And I really wanted to, uh, uh, wanted to learn uh, how to read the Morse code, right? So mm -hmm. I actually looked up uh, some kind of course, and it could only be done in Svazarm, which was the association for the cooperation with the army. Everything was totally ideological. This wasn't a course which was ideological. I spent about two months, uh, twice a week uh, of an evening, going to a class where they basically taught us how to, how to actually uh, read uh, Moscow. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. So this was the why, why did I do this in my, in my sort of final year of secondary school? And uh, the, the other thing that, of course, uh, because the radio was uh, getting more and more kind of jammed, I basically, because I knew English now, I switched over to listening to the BBC World Service, which was, which was unjammed. You could, you could actually hear it here normally. And I actually was quite provocatively listening to it, allowing it to blare aloud at bus stops here in the old town. <laughs> um, but... Um, um, Right. What, what, what was I? Uh, what, what was I? So, so I knew English relatively well, and there were in entrance exams. Okay, mm. and uh, m later my teacher um, Yarmila Emerova, who taught English in the English department of the arts faculty here, and she is actually the Irena in the novels of Josef, Josef Škvorecký. He basically fancied her and made her the hero of his novels. Skvoretsky by this time was in Canada. She was in uh, at the uh, arts faculty here. Yeah, it's quite interesting. In 1970, Skvoretsky published his Tank Battalion novel in Canada, which had been banned here. And in that edition from Toronto, he uh, he uh, does a dedication to Yarmila and Vladimir Emerovi. So actually, quite weirdly, nothing happened to them. Uh, I mean, she he, she showed us this. Yeah. <laughs> when we were at university, which Kowalski actually dedicated this novel to her. Yeah. So e Emerova was actually uh, supposed to be uh, preparing the candidates for study at Charles University um, uh, f f f f to the communist authorities who were uh, yeah. going to veto whom to allow or whom to not to allow. Yeah. And she later on, when I was a student, said, you really were a problem because you were the best of the candidates but you were not a member of any uh, political organization. You were not a member of the Socialist Union of Youth. Damn it. What were we supposed to do? Then, as a kind of, in the sort of final 12th hour, I noticed that you did this co uh, uh, Morse code co uh, course in that Svazarm pro-army organization. Yeah. So I took a red felt tip and wrote there in big letters, Jan Chuli collaborates with the communist army and is a member of the Svazarm organization. <laughs> and apparently this is why I was allowed to study at the arts faculty of Charles University. Wow. Obviously, the English department uh, uh, was freer uh, English than the, 
um, uh, Czech literature department, even though obviously we found uh, conspir conspiratorial lecturers in the in the in the Czech departments as well. Yeah. But uh, we had absolute conspiracy with our English teachers. Also, there was a Fulbright lecturer uh, from America. Uh, so, so basically, uh, and and there was uh, this New Zealander translator of. Uh, uh, Miroslav Holub's poetry, Ian Milner. So basically, we attended classes, and oh, and there was a British Council uh, lecture of English. So basically, what I this is quite paradoxical that between seventy two and seventy seven, when I studied here, I lived in an English speaking bubble, because yeah. actually I attended classes by an American uh, uh, professor, uh, English professor, uh, Australian professor, who did English literature, and then we had classes of of English language with the British Council lecturer, and yeah. then of course some other classes by the Czechs. So. Uh, so it was really quite interesting that uh, this was, again, uh, well, a kind of bubble which didn't really uh, exist in the real world of normalization. And uh, in 75, uh, I worked as a student guide at this summer school of Slavonic languages, which I suppose is eternal. Uh, so I was, I was a student guide for, for uh, the English and American Students there. I got into trouble there a little bit. Uh, there was a because I, um, I did did have some problems with the secret police. I'm slightly. Uh, I now have to go back slightly. I yeah. was a fil uh, amateur filmmaker, and uh, I actually made a film about the demonstrations which took place on the 28th of no uh, October '68, the 50th anniversary of of the founding of Czechoslovakia and there were kind of pro-nationalist kind of flags and everything and anti, anti uh, sort of, sort of demo, uh, invasion demonstrations. And uh, I won a, uh, the first prize at some kind of amateur film competition with this deeply nationalistic 10 minute film, right? From this and encouraged as I was as a 16 year old on the first anniversary of the death of Jan Palach in January 70. I wanted to do this thing, go, go to get another prize for another film. So I actually went to the, uh, to the grave on, of Jan Palach, uh, took some, uh, sort of uh, filmed it, filmed people uh, standing there, uh, wanting to do a, a brief film about Jan Palach. And as I left that, uh, uh, of, of that um, uh, cemetery, Waiting uh, wait, while waiting for a tram at the tram stop nearby, I was nobbed by two secret policemen and uh, interrogated for 12 hours. And of course, I was a 16 year old, they couldn't uh, uh, do anything, but they confiscated that camera, they confiscated that film. I, I had that camera was on loan from somebody, they returned it to the old man who owned it, and uh, nothing basically ca ca came out of it. Yeah. Uh, then they brought me home. Um, and my mother basically told them off. So they saw, I, I was trying to be kind of conciliatory, and she said, what, what do you mean, the terrorizing this 60-year-old? You should be shame, ashamed of yourself. So, so anyway, yeah. so, so this, is, this was one experience, and then during, as a, as a, as a, um, uh, during the Charter 77 year, 77, it was my final year, mm -hmm. um, of the anti-charter came round uh, the classes and we were supposed to sign it. And this is, I, I'm, I was very extrovert and basically the, this lecturer came and said, we well, were supposed to sign this. And I just kind of yelled in that class, I'm not going to fucking hell sign this rubbish. And she kind of looked at me and then uh, called me into her cabinet later and said, yeah, you should really sign it. But I didn't. But, right. but they called me for they called me for a uh, they called me for, uh, the secret police called me for a uh, for an interrogation in connection with this charter seventy seven thing and this is connected with that with that uh, summer school in seventy five. Yeah. So I was responsible for 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 this group of about thirty uh, people from America and from the United Kingdom mm. uh, who came to study Czech here. I actually got some good friends from it. And it's very interesting. One of the Americans was an a, 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 a American army pilot. Wow. <laughs> and it was really quite interesting to actually sit with, I don't know, he may have been a member of the CIA or something. I yeah. don't know. It was interesting to sit in Prague pubs with this person who was learning Czech here, right? Yeah. And then there was a, there was a young 
a scholar from a very affluent American family. His name was John Kunstatter. And I, as a kind of 20-year-old, I basically talked, uh, talked um, totally openly with them. I remember we were in kind of, uh, you know, we had these coaches where we took them for trips. And I, I, I as a student guide, had, was, had this microphone and there was this this bus full of uh, uh, full of uh, foreign students, and it went along uh, Potici. And La Potici, there was the editorial offices of Rude Pravo, right? And I had yeah. this microphone. I was telling them where the various sites are, right? And I had this microphone and said, "Look, in that place, the communists have their daily newspapers, editorial offices." <laughs> and I, I, the, the the sort of official from the university kind of looked at me. <laughs> Because you and the communism were, of course, supposed to be identifying with the communists. Yeah. Right? But there was no problem. But uh, I had op- totally free discussions about what it was like with this uh, student, uh, John Kunstatter. And I don't know what happened. Because whether he went back to, uh, uh, he was some kind of uh, intern in Radio Free Europe. And he may have talked about uh, me somewhere. Mm-hmm. And I was actually tested by the secret police uh, maybe, well, for, for several weeks. And they did mention John Kunstatter and said that he was a CIA agent and I was a CIA agent and all that kind of stuff. So it was slightly difficult. But uh, they didn't expel me from university. They yeah. did expel uh, a couple of people from a, uh, from a higher uh, year, um, which is, I am maybe creating a, an absolutely liberal image here, but it is true that... Uh, um, what was his name? I now forget. Uh, it's easily uh, um, uh, easily found. Uh, students who were above uh, my year were uh, objecting to the fact that if you wanted to, to apply for travel to the West, that you had to get a ref- recommendation from the officials of the Socialist Union of Youth, even though you were not a member of the union. Mm. And they public- put, an, put up a notice demanding a public big discussion about this. And on the basis of this, they were actually expelled from university before their final exams. So it was horrendous. But they were one or two years above me. I only learned about it later. But so, so, so I would like to sort of put this into proper context. So while we had anti-communist conspirator- conspiratorial relations with our lecturers, mm. we didn't actually uh, do anything as public as this and the, obviously the regime would have been quite nasty because it would have actually, would have actually uh, expelled us because it did expel some people. Yeah. Yeah. So, 75, uh, summer school, mm-hmm. this American air pilot uh, introduced me to my future wife, uh, a Scottish animator who came here on a British Council scholarship in 75 uh, to make an animated film at the Prague Film Studios. Wow. <laughs> and uh, we married uh, in 78, 77, and uh, uh, received permission to, uh, to leave the country. Right. And was, because that quite, I think, was that quite easy to get that permission or not? It was uh, incredibly bureaucratic, and I had to pay for my education, which was about 30,000 uh, crowns, which was now ridiculous, but it would have been the equivalent of about half a million now, I suppose, right? But... Uh, um, I suspect that um, I could have been uh, uh, persecuted as a single Czechoslovak citizen. When you have a British wife, it was a little bit more difficult. Okay? Yeah. And for instance, uh, at the university, we had these uh, universities, there was compulsory uh, military. Um, uh, service and yeah. the uh, university students uh, were supposed to go to the army for a year after graduation but for the final two years of their study they had to spend one day a week uh, on the training ground military training ground and then in the summer to spend uh, about six weeks uh, in a military camp right yeah. which which basically turned them into an officer and you were an officer of the communist army uh, a compulsory uh, 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 f- 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 service, yeah. but obviously um, it was problematic. 
uh, everything in the army was incredibly secret and we mustn't allow anything to the imperialist. And then I was getting these letters from my wife, who was British. Yeah. And, and uh, when I was actually uh, uh, sort of interrogated by the secret police uh, during that Charter 77, uh, uh, around Charter 77 with that John Kunstatter um, uh, scandal, they came for me to drag me out of this house and uh, my mother said at that point, I'll give him his dinner first So and you wait outside. So they waited outside and in the meantime, uh, my wife came in and they were driving me uh, they were driving me to the to Bartolomeska uh, secret police headquarters, and uh, when they put me in the car, they, they said, "Is that that Leslie?" So obviously, yeah, uh, uh, closely watched. So I, 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 I think so. Anyway, what happened was you had to uh, put together about maybe thirty different documents, mm. and uh, they all had limited validity. So you had to you had to uh, make sure that they didn't expire. And uh, uh, it was a complicated, uh, yeah. complicated thing. But yeah. uh, I was one of the few people. They usually allowed this, uh, allowed women to marry Westerners and right. go to the West, right? Yeah. Uh, I think that few. There were fewer men. I don't understand why they let me off that army. Mm. But again, uh, it could be could have been because mm. of, of sort of having a, a sort of potentially explosive person who was well, going yeah, to. Yeah, I think. You know, uh, to be extrovert everywhere and kind of put, put stuff into, you know, uh, f- f- sort of British wife's domain uh, w- w- may have been. I don't understand it. Yeah, but, I uh, mean, possibly they thought that, um, you know, you were a troublemaker and they were best rid of you in the UK rather than you staying. And I thought, look, this is wonderful. I have a Czech passport. I can go there where, where, whenever they want. While uh, I can just travel between the the, the saddle, the Iron Curtain, I came here once in uh, in the the summer of seventy eight. Yeah. And then my uh, uh, friends told me that they have been rounded by the secret police, uh, who warned them against me that I was a CIA agent. Right? right. So I took that as a as a warning that I shouldn't actually be coming here, and I wait, waited until I got my British passport. Yeah. Yeah. So. When when the secret police took you in, um, uh, did they try and uh, get you to be an informer or anything like that? Did they try and offer you no. inducements? Oh, yes, 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 they did. But yes, it, well, basically the thing uh, was that because the problem was under communism, you were it was actually a criminal offense not to be enthusiastically supportive of the regime, right? Mm-hmm. So actually, you in the secret police uh, um, interrogation, I wasn't a dissident. You had to pretend that you actually went along with them. And so, for instance, in this chapter 77, I mean, I admitted, I think, to them that I read that document, right? Mm-hmm. That, uh, the, 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 the declaration of chapter 77. Yeah. And, um, and they, of course, immediately said, who gave it to you, right? Yeah. My response was, somebody dropped it in my letterbox. <laughs> you had to constantly invent these dead ends for them. Yeah. Right? So, so uh, I think they did uh, ask me to be uh, an informant, and I said, I am, I am not intelligent enough. This is one other thing, very Schweikian. Uh, the only way that you could actually, under the regime, avoid anything that the regime wanted of you was by pretending that you're too stupid to be able to do it. <laughs> it, wasn't be, it was beyond my, my uh, intellect's limits, right? Yeah. And that was the only excuse how you got out of it. <laughs> I like that. Which is problem, uh, problematic because it just basically encourages you to, to behave like an idiot, you know? Yeah. But I, I would imagine they would have found that hard to believe with you being... Of university education. Yes, but I mean, yeah, but I mean, I will, well, okay, I kept repeating it. Yeah. Yeah. And then they just, they just thought, oh, we'll try somebody who's a bit easier. we we'll give up on this one. <laughs> well, we talked for over two hours, and there's some extra material available on our Patreon page at patreon.com slash Cold War Pod. And Patreon is spelt P A T 
R E O N. It was great to hear from somebody who'd actually been there, an eyewitness account, and I'm delighted that Jan was uh, able to share that with us. Uh, there is extra information in the show notes. Those can be found at coldwarconversations.com slash the word episode and the number 17. I'd also like to especially thank our new Patreons who are helping us uh, keep the podcast on the air financially. They are Christian Diaz, Jeff, Mary Freer, Sasha Maggio, Simon Smith and the Spybury podcast. I'd also like to thank the following people for leaving reviews on iTunes. It is much appreciated. They are Sir Marcus Carolinas, D. Cressa, and Bill the Wildcat. I'm loving those review names. Don't forget, you can also comment on our Cold War Conversations Twitter and Facebook accounts. Just search for Cold War Conversations on both. That's it for me for today. Thank you very much for listening, and goodbye. This is the Voice of America, Washington, D.C., signing off. Thank <laughs> you.